What is up, everybody? I'm really excited for you to watch this interview with Dr. Eric Wan. It is all about brain health and this new uh, revolutionary technology that is showing a lot of promise for healing a variety of different neurological conditions, including PTSD. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear the wisdom and information from Dr. Wan on what they are doing with Wave Neuroscience and at the Brain Treatment Center. I had the opportunity to get an EEG brain scan from the team at Wave Neuroscience and I got to get an analysis from one of the top interpreters of EEG scans in the world who showed me about my the way my brain's functioning and where I should be optimally functioning. And just learning about what these guys are doing really got me excited. Uh, as many of you might know, I've been dealing with Lyme disease and on this healing journey, which has caused me a variety of sleep issues and other neurological issues. So hearing the promise has gotten me excited and just learning about everything they're doing. So without further ado, I'll let you guys listen to this interview and I'm gonna read uh, an impressive bio from Dr. Eric Wan. So here we go. Dr. Eric Wan is president of Wave Neuroscience Inc., a biotech company that has innovated breakthrough technologies called magnetic e-resonance therapy and synchronized transcranial magnetic stimulation. That was a lot. These technologies utilize computational neuroanalytics and brain imaging to customize treatment protocols with the aim of restoring optimal neurological function. These represent a form of personalized medicine that are currently in clinical trials, which is really exciting. Eric joined Wade Neuroscience after serving as the Chief Physician and Chief Technology Officer for the Boeing Company. Dr. Wan also served as a, Na a U.S. Navy flight surgeon and has been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals, textbooks, and presented in many academic conferences. He completed his residency at the Harvard Residency Program and received an MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health and an MBA from the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business. Dr. Eric's credentials are quite impressive and I got to see firsthand going to their clinic and talking with some of the people who've gone through this treatment, uh, the profound tech, uh, impact this technology is having on people ranging from veterans to NFL stars and people just like you and I. So without further ado, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Eric Wan. Awesome. Well, Dr. Eric Wan, thank you so much for being here today. I have been learning more and more about what you guys are doing, and I'm fascinated, and I have a lot of different questions. So my first question actually for you is, when you were younger, did you always know you wanted to pursue a path in medicine and health? That's a great question. Before I go in, in, into that, just, you know, thank you for, for being here and, and having the interest. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, it's, it's very much a pleasure to, to spend the time with you and to share a little bit about uh, what we do. But um, no, you know, I don't know that I knew in, in the very beginning kind of that I would go down the pathway of medicine. Um, you know, my sister's, uh, you know, she's a physician, uh, she's a cardiothoracic surgeon. And um, when I saw her going down that road, she was a bit of a role model for me. And so I had that interest. But I think the blend of science and, um, you know, helping people, helping humanity was something that appealed to me. And so, uh, so yeah, I ended up going down that pathway. Uh, but I don't know if I knew that, you know, when I was, when I was a youngster. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you graduated undergrad university, what was your mindset? Did you, was there a specific job that you were excited about or a specific career that you wanted to pursue or, uh, you know, coming out of undergrad, I knew, I knew that the medicine was going to be sort of the pathway that I went down. I didn't know what specialty I would be. Um, but my, my first year in medical school, there was a, uh, Navy recruiter that came by and, um, just the thought of being able to serve country and, um, you know, having kind of that adventure w was appealing to me. So I, I did end up, um, you know, having a little bit of a pivot and going down mm -hmm. the military medicine track and, uh, which was tremendous. I, I really enjoyed that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say that sort of set me in a trajectory that was in some ways non-traditional and um, uh, kind of part of how I ended up here. Yeah. But and when you were in the Navy, did you have any firsthand experience of people, um, other people in the military who were starting to struggle with certain brain or, or mental health conditions as a result of ac active duty? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's such an interesting conundrum because uh, the military is one of the few communities where uh, people just the sense of, uh, brotherhood and working together as a team, uh, there's sort of, uh, 
a disincentive to acknowledge that something is going wrong or that I'm not feeling right. And, um, you know, that sort of uh, culture, um, you know, it's changed a lot. But at that time, it was difficult to acknowledge whether it's concussion, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, um, that those kind of uh, feelings could be creeping in or that people might be struggling. Mm -hmm. And I would say only within the last five to 10 years has there been uh, any sort of acceptance of this is our reality and let's see what we can do to address the issues and um, help our warriors to heal. Yeah. And so that's part of, I would say, a fundamental part of our mission. But certainly uh, when I was serving, there were elements of that. And um, after 9-11 and um, you know, the second Gulf War, uh, we were the military was serving in a very kinetic environment and sort of the signature injuries uh, of those conflicts was uh, concussions traumatic brain injuries just just the training uh, i think there's a lot of uh, head injury that occurs mm -hmm. and we didn't always think of the ways those injuries could be sustained where uh, a blast injury even though you're not mechanically striking your head against a wall yeah or um uh, not necessarily even losing consciousness, just the overpressurization and the blast wave that comes from a detonation uh, can cause um, can cause some low grade injuries or even moderate to severe concussion, depending mm -hmm. on the proximity to the blast. So uh, even those types of injuries, uh, I think, were invisible for quite a while and mm -hmm. only now are becoming better understood. And the science around brain science in general, neuroscience and um, I, I think how these injuries are sustained, we've become a lot smarter about that. And, uh, you know, some of our pre-discussion, uh, big wave surfing. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of um, kind of pressure when you're sucked underneath a wave. And, yeah. Um, Life or death situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All kinds of different mechanisms you don't always think about. Car accidents are a very common mm -hmm. cause of uh, concussion and traumatic brain injury. So, um so yeah, you know, my, my time in the service was definitely a precursor to what was to come. I don't know that anyone really realized the magnitude of the issue at that time. You think about all our recreational sports, um, you know, it, I think everyone thinks of football, mm -hmm. uh, but even some lesser contact sports like soccer uh, or, um, you know, certainly rugby, basketball, these kind of sports, um, can lend themselves towards sustaining injuries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with MMA gaining popularity, these pugilistic sports, I, you know, the mission is to concuss your opponents. So, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely an issue that's uh, rising both in prevalence, but also, I think, public consciousness as well. Yeah. And have you noticed a shift in the last, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15, or even 20 years in terms of addressing the reality that people are struggling because it seems even just in my experience the stigma of mental health it, it's being talked about more and more but maybe 10 15 years ago that wasn't maybe the case like it it's much more prevalent in my understanding that ptsd is a real thing and lots of people maybe weren't aware that that was what they were experiencing yeah i i think on multiple levels that's becoming the case i think that as um courageous public figures are able to come forward and say, you know, I'm having uh, an issue and I'm getting help. Um, I think it emboldens other people to be courageous for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the other part of it, I think as the science evolves, what we're realizing is, um, you know, post-traumatic stress and concussion were kind of poorly defined entities in the past, but now with neuroimaging and functional imaging, uh, we can see some of the changes in neuronal function that may lend themselves towards um, kind of an objective way of, of observing uh, something has gone awry. Mm -hmm. And I think from the patient experience, it's fairly dis disarming to realize, gosh, it's not just all in my head, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, there is uh, an organic injury. There is something here that is causing me... Um, to maybe not be the same person that I was mm -hmm. a few years ago. And that sort of discussion and realization, you know, I think that's the beginning of uh, a genuine healing process. And now that there are tools that allow people to help themselves, and it doesn't even have to be 
um, you know, neuromodulation, just uh, people being more conscientious about the kind of foods and nutrition that they're putting in their body, exercising the right way, um, meditation, mindfulness, um, all these things I think are allowing people um, to, to have better kind of wellness and uh, uh, overall well-being. So uh, I, I think that there's definitely a movement in the right direction. We mm -hmm. still have uh, a long ways to go, but mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by the steps that are being taken. Yeah, that's, that's promising. <laughs> yeah. And where were you in your life when you heard about neuromodulation and magnetic e-resonance therapy? Did I get that correct? You did. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, so where were you, like, what was your first initial reaction when you heard of it, and what was kind of that spark that, that made you really pay attention to, wow, there's something, there's something profound going on here? Yeah, so it's funny. I, I actually, the first time I heard about, um, and, and so MERT is kind of the methodology and the algorithms we use to analyze uh, brain imaging. My wave TMS is the kind of the therapeutic um, that we're applying. So it must have been about 2012 when, you know, I learned about this technology. And at that time, I was the uh, chief physician uh, for a Fortune 50 aerospace company, and I played a secondary role as the chief technology officer. And so I had heard about this technology and that it was showing some promising results for a wide range of conditions. And I was just skeptical. Uh, anytime you hear the word magnet, it automatically evokes a little bit of skepticism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I kept hearing about it and I wanted to see data. And the preliminary data came out and it showed some fairly significant uh, improvements in the post-traumatic stress community. And so uh, as fate would have it, I did have a friend who was really struggling um, with that. And he was going to the VA and doing everything he could. To and you met him when you were in the Navy? Yeah. Yeah. And so we'd actually lost touch for um, 10, 11 years. And it was through our community of friends that people had reached out and said, hey, can you do anything to help? Mm -hmm. And I spoke to his VA doctors, and uh, they had felt like uh, they had done everything they could, and um, you know, he was still struggling. So I suggested he try uh, going through a round of the technology. I didn't know if it would be of, of real benefit. Mm -hmm. but And do you know um, what symptoms he was experiencing? And, um, and he, he was uh, in combat, or what was... Yeah, a little bit of backstory on this guy. Yeah, so he was he he was a, a crew chief for, and we're we're in a helicopter squadron together, um, that supported. Um, uh, it was the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit, and we were supporting uh, a number of different missions. But we were providing air transport to to troops going to different locations, mm -hmm. and uh, we had the unfortunate distinction of being um, sustaining some of the first casualties of the Second Gulf War. Wow! And so as a result of that. Um, you know, 150 of my closest friends uh, were struggling in some different ways, mm -hmm. and he was particularly close to some of them. And in bringing the bodies back to the U.S., uh, in particular, I think it was uh, fairly traumatic for him. Um, so, uh, and we all deal with it in our own way. And um, he was nothing but the most successful um, and determined person. One of the most the term people that I knew. And so to hear that he was struggling really surprised me. Mm -hmm. And I knew he wasn't somebody who um, would give up or not exhaust every option that he had. And so it, it definitely caught my attention that he, he was struggling. And so I reached out to him and uh, suggested he come in and try. In terms of his symptoms, um, like a good Marine, he was listening to uh, everything the VA doctors told him. And he was taking um, quite a few medications, I think up to 20 pills per day. Wow. And he would tell you now that that was part of the problem, that he was kind of so gorked up on uh, drugs and polypharmacy that he was having trouble just thinking clearly and getting through his day. And all, you know, all well-intentioned, I think. Looking back, uh, I can see why those prescriptions were there for him. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think that that cocktail of medications wasn't serving him well. Um, he was also uh, just struggling with motivation, uh, wasn't, um, wasn't able to think clearly. I think he would describe he, he was having some cognitive fog. Um, and uh, the, the thing that startled me was that he had such a quick 
uh, turnaround really within two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, he was saying that he was able to think more clearly. He was getting, uh, restorative sleep for the first time in about 10 years. And, uh, if I didn't know him, uh, I I think I probably would have struggled to believe that that was possible in such a short window, but it was also, uh, his wife who, you know, she came to our clinic and was in tears saying, you know, this is the man I married 10 years ago. You gave me my husband back. And that kind of validation, um, uh, it, it was kind of a turning point for me where I decided there's something more here that could be an inflection point for medicine because we don't have great tools in the bag for uh, behavioral health, mental health conditions. And what I learned over time is just the imaging itself is a bit of an innovation to be able to see um, what neuronal function is doing in the brain to have these uh, brain maps and they became digitized in about 2009 where we could do much more sophisticated analyses. Um, that to me was very compelling Mm -hmm. because uh, so many of uh, these men and women will tell you, you know, they got MRIs and CT scans and they were told that everything is normal. And that is true from an anatomic perspective. Mm -hmm. Many concussions, you can't see anatomic changes or bleeds, uh, but we know that neurons uh, start not functioning as well as they should. And to now have tools where, uh, you know, we can see some of that, uh, activity mm-hmm. uh, is, is quite meaningful. And so in my friend's case, um, you know, he had a profound change. He um, withdrew a lot of the medication used voluntarily. And he didn't tell me he was doing that. He just uh, called me about six, week a- six weeks after starting treatment and said, I'm off all of my drugs. And, all uh, 20 of the pills. Yeah. Yeah. And so at that time, without knowing better, I, I just told him, that could be quite harmful. Yeah, you totally. may have withdrawal symptoms. You should, you should go back on some of them. And he said, "No, you know, I'm I'm actually off, and I feel as well as I felt in years, and this was good." And well, what I learned is he didn't go cold turkey. He actually scare stepped himself down off of uh, the medications. And the one where you can really have withdrawals, there's two classes of medications that can be harmful. One is uh, opioid medications, mm-hmm. and we have this sort of national epidemic of uh, opioid overuse. Um, and benzodiazepines, uh, which are anxiolytics or anxiety medications, that mm-hmm. can also double as muscle relaxants. And coming off of those drugs can, uh, there's actually physiologic dependence that can cause quite a bit of withdrawal symptoms. And what I learned from the scientists and engineers here was that um, there's actually a significant uh, bump in dopamine, an increase in dopamine in animal models. And because of that, it's thought that uh, people can have a fairly soft landing coming off of these uh, physiologic dependencies. And that's what happened in my friend's case. Mm-hmm. And so he was empowered uh, to come off of these medications. Uh, he did it, and he hasn't looked back. Wow. You know, he's uh, gone on to get two master's degrees, and it's currently uh, in the middle of an executive MBA. And... Um, uh, I couldn't be more happy for him. Just a tremendous success story. Yeah, that's amazing. And my wheels are turning because I know a, a few people in my life who've been on benzos and had some serious side effects. And I think, you know, modern medicine is doing the best we can. It's not like we're prescribing these to people to make them have worse worse conditions. But if there are opportunities and modalities out there that can heal people without some of these serious side effects, it's it's promising. And so to hear that that was the case for your friend, that must have opened the the door of possibility in your mind. Yeah. And, and that's really, I think, part of the draw was, um, you know, we always talk about disrupting industries and, um, you know, doing something that is really impactful for humanity. And this was one of those, this was one of those kind of uh, innovations where I realized that the way we practice medicine could really change quite dramatically. And uh, kind of going back to, you know, you'd asked how how I got involved. Um, I was perfectly content to stay in my current job and kind of be a cheerleader from the sidelines and Mm -hmm. do what I can to move it forward. And uh, there was a uh, Navy SEAL Master Chief who actually kind of confronted me and, challenged me you know, put his finger in my chest and said what do you stand for brother you know meaning are you going to stay in this sort of corporate world 
and uh, not really get completely involved or are you going to get in the trenches and help out your brothers and sisters and um, you know at the time uh, it was a discomforting conversation but uh, as I spoke to my wife you know she brought up the point that this was really just about the only thing that I was talking about and I was so passionate about it and if there are these vulnerable populations that we can help and there's 22 veterans committing suicide a day uh, how do you not jump in and so it was kind of this moral crossroads uh, that I think um, I came up against and decided to, to jump in uh, about five years ago to explain a little bit about the technology it's really kind of a, a three to four step process where uh, the first step, as you experience, is we get this EEG, mm-hmm. and the EEG has been around for a uh, hundred years in analog form, and we've known that you can map sort of these electrophysiological uh, changes in the brain, but it got digitized in about 2009, and we can now do sophisticated discriminant analyses on uh, how somebody's brain is functioning, and we run that through normative, a normative database, and we can see. Um, Number one, how people are functioning currently and perhaps where they might be if they were in a more optimal situation. Mm -hmm. And so all of us have a unique uh, dominant frequency in which our brain will encode information. And this, what you're saying right here, is something I learned yesterday that that I had no idea. So I find this part really fascinating. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's it's kind of pulling back the curtain on uh, a lot of our, you know, overall... Uh, cognitive health and function Mm -hmm. but most of us are living somewhere between 8 to 13 hertz in terms of our alpha frequency so during our wakeful hours um, we tend to live in what's called the alpha band and so there's um, beta alpha theta delta you know and um, this was very well uh, researched kind of in sleep studies interestingly but in the alpha state when we're in our wakeful stage uh, we're all encoding information 8 to 13 times per second. And there will be a dominant wavelength with which we predominantly live. And so let's just say in a hypothetical, you're 11.5 hertz. And I might be 8.9 hertz, and our friend might be 10.3 hertz. It doesn't matter. It's just kind of where we're born and where we're comfortable. But whether it's through the physical trauma of uh, a blast injury or the emotional trauma of losing a loved one or the chemical trauma of uh, doing hard drugs for years, we may find areas of the brain that fall out of synchrony with that dominant wavelength. Mm -hmm. And so in these brain maps, you may see an area of the brain that's two standard deviations away from that norm. Mm -hmm. And hypothetically, if we saw a spot in the front left-hand side of the brain, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that's cycling at two hertz, or, uh, you know, because that's the executive function area of the brain, uh, the stereotypical waveform pattern that reflects maybe an individual who's a bit depressed and lethargic and may not have motivation to get out of bed. Um, And in a separate scenario where, let's say somebody took a hit to the right backhand side of the brain, they fell off a ladder, um, and these neurons are firing, let's just say, 35 to 40 times per second. Because your visual cortex resides in that area, you may be scanning your environment 35 to 40 times per second. And if the executive function area of your brain can only process it 11.5 times per second. There's an information overload. That person may experience anxiety. And so these images tell us an awful lot about how somebody's experiencing the world and how you might strive to um, heal those different areas. And, And so that's where we start deriving protocols for treatment. And then we use this technology called transcranial magnetic stimulation which is FDA cleared for depression, but we're using it off-label to treat other conditions. Mm -hmm. And we just navigate to whatever geographic area of the brain is not functioning well, and we'll give it gentle stimulation to nudge it back in the direction it needs to go. So if there's a group of neurons that are firing at 2 hertz, we're going to give them that friendly reminder that you should be at 11.5. And over time, the body does most of the work for you, and you return back to that dominant frequency that the rest of your brain is, is firing at. And... I think that sort of taps into uh, what most of the medical community has um, has become well established is that we're healing organisms and whether you put two ends of a wound margin together if you have a laceration from a knife if you put two ends of a wound margin together it'll heal Uh, if you have a broken bone if you approximate the two 
ends of the bone, that'll heal. Mm -hmm. The brain's not all that different. If it gets stuck in the wrong frequency, sometimes it just needs a reminder that uh, you need to get unstuck and move to this frequency. And if we get EEGs every week, every two weeks, and we're giving it this stimulation, we can see those changes happen over time. And in some of our uh, patients who may leave um, because they have work or travel, whatever it may be, and they come back months later, we can still see progress. Many times just that little nudge is all they need to mm -hmm. get them on the path uh, towards healing. So um, it, it's an exciting time where we have these tools now to start monitoring these things. Yeah. And so to summarize, essentially, hypothetically, let's say my brain is operating at 10 hertz, mm -hmm. but through the brain scan, I learned, and this is what was fascinating to me, is like it's so bio-individual. Everyone has a unique optimal frequency. Is that correct? That's correct. So based on my scan, it's saying I'm at 10, but 11.3 would be optimal for me. So I go in and I get this neuromodulation, mm -hmm. and let's say I'll do a, like a two-week course, or is there like a standard course that you'll have that you recommend for people? Everyone's a little bit different. In general, mm -hmm. we're looking at four to six weeks gotcha. uh, for most people, but there are many people who get better within just a couple of weeks. Wow. Um, and yeah. so I get hooked up to the machine, and what, is it, what does it feel like when – uh, have you experienced it yourself? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a gentle tapping. Okay. Um, it's, it's not like a major shock to your. No, no. It's it's not painful. This is not electroconvulsive therapy or any kind of high wattage uh, type thing. This is this is just a gentle pulse to uh, most of the time, you know, the forehead. Uh, in different scenarios, if somebody um, had significant injury to the back of the brain, we might stimulate in that geographic region. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not uh, an overtly painful experience. Many people uh, describe it as a brain massage, and they, they actually enjoy it. Um, so, so yeah, that's, I think, one of the nice features is it's a painless, actually rather effortless experience. Yeah, so. and so after doing that, you know, two or four, six-week course, then I get my brain scan, and then I'm now functioning at 11.3 hertz. And so essentially, it sounds like this machine is is just reminding your body of of what it's like to be in an optimal state and i think this is what to me is so fascinating is i'm always curious about different modalities where they're not and it's not that like for example cancer mm -hmm. uh, the way that chemo works right you're you're radiating the good and the bad but i think what's so fascinating about this technology is you're just reminding the body of the natural healing frequency and it because of the way our body is built and, and i don't know how it works but it can just remember uh that that's the optimal frequency and it just aligns back to that place and that's to me that's like it's tremendous yeah yeah i think it's um it's getting i think more to the root cause mm -hmm. and uh, you know we think back over the last two or three decades on uh, a lot of the innovation around neuroscience has been around neurotransmitters and pharmaceuticals like mm -hmm. serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. And, uh, you know, and I'm not on an anti-pharma bandwagon by any means, uh, but many times just adding chemicals or trying to replace deficient chemicals isn't giving us durable, long-lasting benefit. Mm -hmm. But in these cases, um, in, in the case of the Marine that I was talking about, he's three years out of treatment, still doing great. And it's not without bumps and, you know, you know, turns in the road. I think life uh, throws us all curveballs, especially in 2020. Um, but uh, as long as people are surrounding themselves with um, good influences and, and positive behavioral habits, eating right, exercising right, um, you know, meditation, breathing, all these things, um, you know, people can have uh, kind of indefinite benefit. And so... I think it's sort of uh, part of, uh, as we sort of move down the causal ladder, if you're getting to more root cause issues, uh, I think it empowers people to become the best versions of themselves instead of becoming dependent on uh, pharmaceuticals or other types of substances. Mm -hmm. And since being uh, here at the Brain Treatment Center and involved with wave neuroscience, how many people roughly do you think you've overseen that have come through and gotten treatment? Yeah, so we've treated, I think we're, we, we've gone past 7,000 uh, patients treated. Personally, in, in terms of people that I've tracked, um, I, I think we're over 1,000. And um, 
It's not, I don't want to misrepresent the scenario. Not 100% of people are getting better. Mm-hmm. You know, there are non-responders and, um, you know, it, it's certainly not a panacea. But in terms of uh, interventions and options that are out there, this is one that um, will be suitable for, I think, a lot of people. Yeah. And in terms of what people are typically coming in for, I know you guys uh, see people with autism, PTSD, are there any other big conditions or or things people are experiencing that you see a lot of people come and and also get positive results from? Yeah, I would say the bread and butter. So the FDA clearance for transcranial magnetic stimulation is depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, and specifically uh, major depressive disorder that's been treatment resistant, meaning uh, they've not had uh, remission or response to um, uh, pharmaceutical medications. Mm -hmm. Um, But we've also seen it help for anxiety, post-traumatic stress, um, a number of other conditions. Mm-hmm. So it's tricky, you know, from an FDA perspective, we're not allowed to make claims of efficacy uh, for those things. So I have to be cautious about mm-hmm. uh, treading in those waters. But um, we've seen some promising results. We were trying to um, add to the treatment a lot of rigorous academic study. And so we're moving down the road of partnerships with, um, we've been working with the USC Center for Neuro Restoration. Uh, the Texas A&M Institute for Bioscience Technology, and now um, Ohio State as well. And so, um, as well as uh, our, our large clinical trial uh, with Uniform Services University and um, U.S. Special Operations Command. But we're pivoting that to move more into um, a civilian realm as well, because that was a military population, and uh, we're seeking more generalizable data. And so, um, you know, as the science evolves, I think we're uh, we're getting smarter about the populations that we can help mm-hmm. and I think backing it up with more robust data. Awesome. And one of the things that you had mentioned yesterday is you're starting to see a potential market or interest of people who are looking to elevate their peak performance. And a, a lot of people who listen to the show are entrepreneurs. They're into biohacking. They're looking at how can I find the edge. So because I, and this is something that's fascinated me is Uh, as I've been going through Lyme disease for about eight months now, I know that I know what my 100% is, and I know I'm ways to go to get there. But there are other people who maybe they've just been feeling a little fatigued or sluggish, and they're realizing, you know, something in me I feel isn't right. And and these are high performers already, as is. And so they're looking at what what could I do if I was at 100%. And so what do you what do you see as the potential there with this technology for entrepreneurs, but businesses, and, and just kind of everyday people who are looking to gain an edge. Yeah, that part's been fascinating to me. It, it's not something that I think as physicians and scientists, it's not where you first look. <laughs> it was more yeah. of an incidental finding that people were experiencing performance improvements. And so in our, in our initial pilot study on post-traumatic stress, we had a number of uh, military veterans and operators who would tell us, you know, their marksmanship scores had gone up and that they were uh, more focused, they're sleeping better, and so we're seeing this spectrum of um, benefits that we weren't necessarily anticipating. Mm -hmm. And when we visited, uh, I I still remember quite vividly, when we visited uh, Special Operations Command headquarters, there's a two-star general who sat us down and said, love what you're doing uh, for the guys, but can we make people better on target? And it wasn't something we were looking to do initially, you know, I, I think our core mission was always about saving lives and stamping out disease. You know, mm-hmm. this is sort of the medical uh, ethos, but um, the market was speaking to us. And there are so many, not just uh, military folks, but executives and uh, high performers in athletics who uh, were seeking a bit of an edge or to restore, you know, I want to feel back to 100%. And, and so that's something that we've uh, dabbled in. We've actually started collecting data on, and we are seeing these improvements in um, executive function reaction times and there's a, a metric that's gaining some traction um, recently called heart rate variability which is a proxy for autonomic tone uh, the sympathetic parasympathetic systems of our body and we're using a wearable called a whoop I don't know if we're allowed to mention sort of brands but yeah no it's yeah, cool it's, it's a wearable device that is tracking a number of different biometrics it's measuring the quality of your sleep uh, which is very nice. Mm-hmm. And, and that was actually what we were after. We wanted to see our people having um, improved quality of sleep. And so in our 
uh, veteran pilot, we were able to see th there's a metric called the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, and we saw a st statistically significant difference uh, in our subjects uh, versus the placebo group. Our subjects were having significantly better quality of sleep, and so we wanted to uh, use other biometric data points to see um, ha you know, what are the qualities that they're experiencing. And so we were seeing improved um, restorative sleep, but we got a call from one of the um, WOLF representatives asking us, what are you guys doing? Because we're noticing a significant change in HRV among a number of people who are you know, getting your treatment. So we'd acquired um, uh, a couple dozen of these devices and asked our patients to wear it so we can see uh, what was happening. And within that uh, subset, um, a number were having significant improvements in their HRV, and so it caught wow. our attention. Um, kind of an unsolicited uh, data point that we weren't really tracking. And so uh, there are some groups, other groups who are interested in HRV, and we learned that uh, this was something that seemed to be improved with the treatment. And so uh, there are groups who considered a proxy for emotional resilience, and um, uh, that's part of the experience, I think, is uh, some people will say they're just more patient, whether it's in parenting or in the boardroom. Um, you know, people have a different level of reserve uh, for managing situations. Other people will describe it as just focus. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not losing their train of thought during a conversation when they have to go on a tangent for a second. Um, and so those are characteristics that are difficult for science to quantify. Yeah, uh, We're doing our best, but they're not um, great tools, and so we've started using, uh, there's a tablet-based uh, neurocognitive assessment called the Brain Check mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, endorsed by the American Academy of Neurology and Psychiatry as uh, a measurement for uh, mild cognitive impairment, but we've been able to see uh, some significant improvements in reaction time. Wow. And, you know, I think for um, elite athletes or even recreational athletes, that's something people would be interested in. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, I, I think this community of uh, people looking for performance edge biohackers, um, that's been one of our uh, more vibrant um, patient demographics, people looking uh, uh, for that kind of benefit. Mm -hmm. And for anyone listening who is maybe experiencing certain symptoms, whether it's lack of sleep or just headaches, fatigue, and if they weren't at this moment able to do this technology of neuromodulation what in all of the experience you have of understanding the brain what would you recommend people of like the top one or two things that they can focus on to improve to improve their health and brain function you know I think the most important thing um, and there's increasing awareness around this but everyone really needs to protect their sleep and and so sleep is so foundational across a number of different dimensions but you think about the single most effective way people can improve their performance, I, I would endorse uh, doing everything you can to ensure high quality sleep. Um, and I think people have a basic understanding of sleep hygiene, uh, not having caffeine or nicotine, you know, late in the day, um, not having kind of heavy, rich meals too late, you mm -hmm. know, in the day before you go to sleep. Um, but one of the discoveries that may be lesser known is uh, circadian rhythm and getting blue light in the morning. And so, you know, perhaps one message that would be useful for uh, your audience is uh, in the morning, um, it's very helpful to get natural sunlight, uh, even on a rainy day. You know, it, it, in, if you're in an area that's, uh, uh, you know, under an overhang, there's enough natural sunlight um, to start establishing your circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. And the science behind that, and, and there are two Nobel Prizes awarded for discovery of circadian rhythm and blue light, wow. um, is... Uh, when you get natural sunlight, blue spectrum light, 450 to 500 nanometers, when it hits your retina, it causes a cascade of uh, biological reactions where 12 to 14 hours later, there'll be a spike in melatonin. And you have to listen to that signal that mm -hmm. when you get sleepy late at night, you have to go to bed. And if you do that, you very rapidly go into deep sleep. And, and I want to touch momentarily on why deep sleep is so important. Um, but you know, this is thousands, millions of years of evolution. We've been, um, you know, a species that uh, sleep is critical to us. And Matthew Walker, one of the preeminent uh, sleep specialists, 
uh, not just in the country, but in the world, has mentioned that uh, we're the only species in nature that will elect to deprive itself of sleep <laughs> without cost. Yeah. Right? And, and so it's, it's this curious phenomenon, and whether it's kind of binge watching Netflix mm -hmm. or, you know, getting on your tablet and, and playing games, you know, whatever it might be, um, we need to be a bit more diligent about our sleep. And we know there's very good science now uh, to show us that sleep deprivation, chronic sleep deprivation, can lead to all sorts of poor long-term health outcomes, whether it's um, increased risk of heart disease, increased risk of stroke, um, obesity, insulin resistance. And the one that I think um, is really coming to the forefront now is increased risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And for years, we didn't know what's the relationship between sleep and cognitive decline, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease. And there's some, uh, I think, real breakthroughs in this space within the last decade. And uh, there's a lady, uh, Megan Nettergaard, out of University of Rochester, who um, made a fairly recent discovery of something called the glymphatic system. Mm -hmm. And so what this is, is it, it's almost a plumbing system that resides within your brain um, that sanitizes all of the metabolic waste and debris that is accumulated throughout the day. But it mm -hmm. only happens during deep sleep. And so stage three, stage four sleep is when these specific cells, these glial cells, will shrink in size and allow large channels to uh, open up and um, the cerebral spinal fluid will bathe the neurons in your brain and wash away you know, the oxidative stress that accumulates throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, um, that's fundamental to why we feel refreshed in the morning. If we're not getting good quality sleep, stage three, stage four sleep, um, the specific types of proteins that are deposited and if there are enough consecutive days of poor sleep can phosphorylate and create tangles within your brain. Um, there are these proteins that are called beta amyloid and tau proteins that uh, if you're chronically underslept uh, can accumulate and start causing some cognitive decline. Hmm. And so um, these were really sort of breakthrough studies. There's another study that was done out of uh, Washington University in St. Louis by a researcher uh, David Holtzman, who um, they sleep-deprived subjects for just one day, and they were able to find a significant spike in the amount of tau protein and beta amyloid, and these are sort of the, the signal proteins that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. And so we realize that uh, there is a fundamental linkage between chronic sleep deprivation and cognitive decline. And so if there were one message that I could uh, put out to your audience is, is really protecting their sleep, doing what they can to uh, go to sleep at the same time every night, try to wake up at the same time every day, and uh, and, and make sure you're doing uh, what you can to uh, to protect that sleep. Um, there are a couple other points I was trying to hit, and uh, yeah, well, that I mean that definitely yeah. resonates with me as I used to sleep like a baby. I never had issues sleeping until dealing with Lyme, and I can say. It's definitely a frustrating experience when you wake up every morning and you don't feel rested. And I, I know how that affects me throughout the day. But, I, but I will, now I know I can make an effort to the second I wake up, go to sunlight. I also have my blue light blockers that I wear um, whenever I'm on screens. But it's cool to see that, that uh, I've noticed the emphasis on sleep now is starting to gain more traction just in the communities and the people that I follow. I know Ariana Huffington wrote a book on, yeah. I think it's called like The Sleep Revolution. Because I think there's this emphasis on this entrepreneur kind of go, go, go culture where it's almost glamorized of not sleeping. Oh, I only, I work so much, I only sleep four hours. But this is the, the perfect reminder that without our health, we can't perform in the first place. So Yeah, that's, so that's a great point. The other um, element that was interesting is um, you think about the modern work environment um, we're kind of the first generation that is not getting sufficient blue light. And the, like our ancestors would wake up, they'd go outside. Mm -hmm. um, glass, especially treated glass, tends to filter out blue light. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to replicate Mother Nature. And to give you an idea of the order of magnitude, uh, being outside during the day on a sunny day would give you 70,000 to 90,000 lumen of, of light. Whereas um, if you were to get artificial blue light and put it next to your desk, that might give you five to 7,000 lumen of light. But the intensity of that degrades exponentially over distance. 
Wow. And so it's got to be really close to you. That's right. That's right. And so getting 30 minutes to an hour of blue light in the morning is really critical in terms of establishing a circadian rhythm and setting you up for success later in the evening. Mm-hmm. And the other part to mention is getting blue light too late during the day can confuse your body and keep you alert and awake at night. And mm-hmm. I think people are starting to become smarter about that. Even our phones and our tablets uh, start selectively mm-hmm. like blocking out mode. blue light. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. There, there's a night mode where people aren't getting blue light, but our, our televisions, like you think about how we're bombarded with media these days, whether it's you know the large 70-inch TV, and then you know you might have a laptop, and then you got a tablet, and then you've got a phone, and then you've got you know an 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 iWatch or whatever it is, and so mm-hmm. it's um it's a tricky thing uh, to deprive yourself of that kind of stimulation late at night, but mm-hmm. I think that's an important part of setting yourself up for good sleep is uh, being conscientious of not having blue light emitted uh, late at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in your experience. Where, where science and kind of the, the collective is right now and, and where they see brain function and how the brain works, are there any hypotheses or trends that you're seeing that you think have, that have potential and, and just reshaping what people think in terms of, and I know your guys' mission statement, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it has something to do with um, using the brain physically instead of altering it chemically. Or, if you could speak to that. And, 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 and I guess what I'm getting at is, is there, is there a new path that's being paved here that's going to open our minds to, hey, maybe we should be looking in this direction where maybe the, the collective and the mainstream isn't quite looking at that for, for healing purposes? Yeah, you, you know, I think one of the most important um, shifts, not just in medicine, but I think probably the public consciousness is, um, you know, we as a species have a tremendous amount of biodiversity and personalizing approaches to each individual Mm -hmm. uh, I think is really important. And so one of our core strengths is, you know, we'll personalize treatment to each individual based on uh, the biometric data that we see, you know, in our, in our initial studies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of any dimension you look at to improve your health and wellness in terms of nutrition. uh, There's so many different diets, to be on and mm-hmm. uh, to some degree I think there's an amount of trial and error whether you're doing a ketogenic or a paleo or Ornish or uh, Gundry you know there, mm-hmm. there's so many different diets intermittent fasting um, in terms of exercise regimen too you know some of us uh, love surfing uh, for others you know running uh, is uh, a great form of recreation weightlifting and so each of us I think tailor uh, our own uh, health regimens based on uh, what's best suited to us. But um, I think we're entering an era of precision medicine where we're starting to get smarter about uh, what therapies will be effective and which ones are going to be ineffective and tailoring it to each unique individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I mean, that to me is what struck me as so fascinating about what you guys are doing. And for anyone listening, I had the opportunity to get my brain I got a brain scan yesterday and got to go over the results um, with Dr. Eric and another colleague. And to, to understand, it's so bio-individual. And I think uh, as I'm learning on my own healing journey, uh, what works for Tom and Susie may not work for me, but what works for me may not work for them. And I think it's it can be confusing because I think as a society, we sometimes, like you were mentioning before, it's not this grand it's not necessarily going to work for everyone, but we have to at least give it the opportunity to explore to see if it might work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting. One of the things uh, we get asked quite frequently is, uh, do I have a perfect brain? <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you know, the reality is there's, there's really no perfect brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, what may be a strength can also be a weakness. You know, people who are uh, extremely quantitative thinkers and may be good at math and science may not be as creative. And so... Um, uh, we try to um, steer away from the concept that uh, there, there's one perfect brain. We're, we're just trying to make uh, the best unique individual uh, optimization that, that we can do. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, it's not uncommon to see two or three different areas uh, of the brain that um, are functioning a little bit differently at any given time. And mm-hmm. so um, you, know, you don't necessarily want to uh, want to overtreat or you know take somebody in a direction that they don't want to go. I yeah. think that um, that that's I think 
a part of good medicine and also, um, you know, helping people uh, to become the best versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's summer 2020. If you could fast forward 10 years to 2030, where do you see and hope that the vision for this technology and all the work you're doing, if you could paint the world in 10 years, what would you like to see happening um, with what you guys are doing and then just overall brain function? Yeah, I think a big part of our mission is just um, increasing access to the technology and helping uh, as many people as possible. And so uh, we're moving in a direction where we're trying to improve the portability uh, of the technology and uh, potentially developing in-home technology where people don't have to uh, go to a clinic or get treated um, uh, you know, in a location where they may have to drive or commute through uh, traffic. And so uh, I, I think in the future, uh, both from a hardware and an algorithm perspective, um, I think we're going to be uh, in a totally different space than where we are now. Mm-hmm. Like we're getting smarter uh, all the time, and we're reaching um, – an EEG database size where we can start employing machine learning and artificial intelligence to look at neural networks and to see how can we more efficiently um, approach, you know, brain treatment and uh, optimize function. And, you know, I think that's going to take this in directions that, you know, we're not even contemplating right now, which Mm -hmm. will be exciting. Um, So, yeah, every, it seems every day, every week, there's uh, explosive change in uh, the field of neuroscience and um, uh, where we are, I think, in 2030 is going to be wholly different from where we are now. But I think uh, the way the market and the direction is moving is uh, towards um, more efficient, faster, safer types of treatments. And uh, we're certainly moving in that direction ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's exciting to think that the availability and accessibility is closer probably than we think for the masses. Yeah. Yeah. And before I get into where people can find you online and connect with you, I did want to ask, you've seen, like you said, thousands of people ranging from PTSD, autism, all sorts of different conditions. Is there uh, one specific story or testimonial that sticks out to you that kind of pulled at the heart or was was a a nice firm reminder of why you're doing the work you're doing? That's a great question. You know, there's there are a lot and uh you know i shared um you know the story of of the first case Mm -hmm. uh with you um i mean it was even cool talking to ned yesterday um who's the head of operations here is that correct yes and you know ned was a navy seal for 25 years Mm -hmm. and we were he said he hadn't slept a night and or had poor sleep for 10 years and to hear he said in 11 days in his experience he said he was a completely different person and to me it, it's it's i mean of course the data and doing the due diligence um, to make sure that this is replicable and it's not just placebo is really important but i think there's a power to sitting across from a human being looking into their eyes and them telling you here was the pain i was experiencing for 10 years and sometimes even longer and then getting to this place of and i'm a completely different person in such a short amount of time with little repercussions that to me what, talking with him it, it got me just genuinely excited and and fascinated by like what is even possible here yeah yeah. yeah, I mean, that his is a particularly moving story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in terms of one case that s- sticks out to me, um, you know, we've seen so many veteran and military cases. Um, th- there was one particular case. There, there's a phenomenon for cancer survivors called uh, post-chemotherapy cognitive impairment. Some people call it chemo brain. Mm-hmm. And we had a, a lady who was really quite severely impaired who – uh, was a writer, uh, but couldn't focus long enough to write or even read. And um, she came in for treatment and had a profound response and um, was sharing her story with us. And, you know, as moving, she was very tearful. And, and somehow that really resonated in a way that um, uh, w- was kind of novel and unique to me. I didn't know that this was a population that we can touch, but... Um, yeah, she she was a particularly moving uh, case, and um, she went back to writing, and I, I think was reemployed, and so um, that part's always exciting. 
And, and that's a part, you know, we, we touched on before that science has a difficult time of capturing a lot of these um, qualitative, qualitative, transformative, life-changing experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, my friend who, you know, was struggling so severely, you know, becoming uh, a re-engaged husband and father, mm-hmm. right? Like, how do you put uh, a number around that? Like, yeah. it's just hard to, to quantify that. And um, for this woman, you know, gainful employment, you know, she talked about regaining her dignity. Yeah. And, wow. uh, you know, th- there's many things that aren't articulated within that. She was very disheveled when she came in. I remember within the first week she started putting on makeup again and she uh, had gotten kind of uh, uh, a manicure and, you know, uh, she ha- she sort of had this will to live again. Mm-hmm. And, and so those are things that, you know, we could talk about, um, you know, biometric data points, HRV, uh, there's something called RPQ-16, the River Mead Post-Concussion Questionnaire, and uh, we try to distill these um, qualities in numbers, and I don't think that's really doing justice to uh, the human experience, you mm-hmm. know, what all of, us, all of us go through. And so, um, and that's ultimately why I think we're all in business, yeah. is, um, you know, being able to impart change with our community and, um, you know, doing better for humanity, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amen to that. I think the power of the human story and, and learning the emotions behind, you know, these numbers, it just conveys the magnitude of what, what's actually happening. Yeah. And if someone wants to learn more about what you guys are doing, they want to connect with you, they're interested in getting the treatment themselves, where can people find you guys? So braintreatmentcenter.com is our website and it has a listing of the different centers that our treatment's available in. And um, uh, our technology company is waveneuro.com, and uh, that website is still being built out. should be published hopefully within a few weeks. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're throughout the U.S., uh, also in Australia and um, uh, Panama. And uh, so you can find us in Dallas, Miami, Washington, D.C., uh, Nevada, uh, Coachella, um, Newport Beach, San Diego, um, and uh, there's uh, many more areas to come. So yeah, hopefully I didn't leave anyone off. Yeah, and I'll make sure to link. I'll make sure to link all uh, all the website and everything in the show notes. And anyone listening, if you know someone uh, with PTSD who's been struggling and is looking for something, have them have them check out the Brain Brain Treatment Center. So yeah, well, I just wanted to say again, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, the more I'm learning, the more I'm intrigued with what you guys are doing, and I'm just really excited to see. Uh, the journey and progression of what you guys are doing here. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Eric Wan as much as I did. And if you know someone who is struggling with neurological conditions like those mentioned in the show, make sure to reach out to these guys. There could be a potential solution that could really change your life. Like I shared in the interview, uh, hearing about Ned and all these other people who've had their life completely flipped uh, in the best way possible. So to me, that's really exciting. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch and learn about this groundbreaking technology. Uh, I'll have the information here linked uh, in the description where you can contact Eric and his team if you would like. And again, thanks so much and have an amazing rest of your day. Peace.